Good morning, sound check. Can you guys hear me? Super, apologies for being a couple of minutes late. Uh, a lot to cover in these short sessions and while I've, I've tried to make video content it too, so that it's not just talking about the show things, it's um, uh, a little bit pressed for time, but uh, apologies for that. Um, I'll probably run over a couple of minutes with you as well. So um, depending on if you have to shoot or not, then um, we'll get through as much as we can. Uh, Paul has jumped in and asked the question what we're covering. We are going to be finishing or progressing on part two of the shoulder, which is really a two hour lecture, but I've had to split it into two one hours, two weeks apart. So I'm going to have a little memory rejog for what we covered in the first part for because I forget and um, these groups get mixed up a little bit and I think one of the groups actually didn't have the first first part of the shoulder of, of my shoulder presentation which is the shoulder symptom modification procedure as a framework a la Jeremy Lewis is that something that you guys are all familiar with we covered part one which was the shoulder symptom modification procedure. Is that a completely new term for you guys? Fantastic, so we've heard that. So we're gonna have a quick memory rejog, and then what we're gonna be doing is getting into some of the actual progress, or actual loading exercises that we can do to be able to work with a graduated loaded program. But remember, I've spent time in giving all the caveats and all of the clinical reasons to get to this point, because a lot of people, and some of the exercises that we'll look at will be your classic physio shoulder banded exercises that a lot of people will find boring and they don't do. Maybe they don't understand the benefits, maybe it's not a good exercise for them. For whatever reason, we are now going to be getting to the point where we could make a graduated loading program for the shoulder and that is going to let me just get this under under here that is going to be to pull up this the key things that is what is the base of this up to this point we have developed an acceptable amount of pain with our patients so up to about four or five out of ten is going to be really important that we can normalize that we can work with this. If we don't, then we're not following what every loading program around MSK is telling us, and we're also setting our patients up for failure because they're gonna perceive that they're doing harm when we indeed are actually gonna be doing what they need to be able to get back to the meaningful task. So being able to su suggest, touch it, nudge it, tease it, being able to use hurt doesn't necessarily equal harm, sore but safe is going to be important. But of course, we don't want to be boom and bust, and there's going to be some movements that we probably want to load manage. This is the paper that I brought in to the shoulder work, which is from the lower limb work I presented to you guys by Igor Sancho around making nice, nice clear phases or levels to guide our progressive pain-based program. Now, humans don't work in this nice box format, but our thinking needs to be categorized in some way for making a graduated progression. So I brought that into the shoulder for making phases in a similar format. I'm going to offer it to you because this is really my implementation around this evidence base, which is a development on Jeremy Lewis's implementation attempt, which is to work with the, the dilemma that orthopedic tests don't tell us that much in terms of specificity, specificity of the tissue that's causing the problem. Scanning doesn't tell you that much about the pain either. But we've got a person in front of us who has activities that are clearly provocative, they may be in pain all the time or only on the activities. How do we work with that? So that's what we're going to be, that's what we're going to be using. This was your exercise dosage chart that as I said should be pinned onto the front of your diary or on your wall for being able to have a framework that again is always to be deviated from but your sets reps tempo rest periods as you work through maybe an isometric entry all the way up to speed is this chart here if someone would have given me this when i was in your position it would have helped me and no end because this becomes 
a reference point. So the programs and the um, the, the the loading programs I've offered throughout this presentation cast back and maybe be able to screenshot this so that you can maybe see and follow how and why I've chosen uh, the exercises because they are based off of that as a framework. So then as a quick rejog, we looked at Jeremy Lewis presenting how the shoulder is this amazingly mobile joint. It, it enables us to do incredible stuff like being able to, to throw, like being able to swing, like being able to hang, like being able to take our shirt off and all of these things is what the shoulder should be able to do. And that is, that is what we're going to be, that's what we're going to be keeping and bearing in mind that we're going to be returning a shoulder to being able to do. We looked at how surgery has mixed res response or outcomes for the successful return of somebody to their activities and how it, we have quite a high level of, of, of evidence from systematic reviews, Cochrane reviews, that the mechanism of a successful surgery is probably not that much to do with the surgery, probably more to do with the relative rest that someone has taken from provocative activities. So can we do someone a really big favor in saving risks and saving costs of unnecessary procedures and also liberate the fact that we don't have to do nothing for a long period of time as you will have to after you've had a shoulder surgery and you're in a sling, there's a lot of things that we can do. So this was the, the dilemma that Jeremy Lewis talks about, is how these tests are not that special. They don't tell us if it's a rotator cuff, even though this is what's led us to this point is rotator cuff tendinopathy. We generally can't say that a rotator cuff is the cause of somebody's symptoms, the same as we can't say that a bursa is or that someone's labrum is. But we can say that someone has got a irritation and these movements are currently provocative. It doesn't make sense that we could dis, um, distinguish a one rotator cuff from another. We've got fibers that run all the way through and we've evolved them to be able to deal with the fact that we may not always have one, as will be the case in a rupture. All of the shoulder is innovated. Hence, when we have a provocative activity, it could be any and all of those structures. So, where has this problem around, arose from if we are if we are careful in our guiding of our history and our questioning there will be somewhere in someone's history there will be a change to their time overhead or through high fast movements that's the compression movement and that is the um the the, the high and fast load component there will be somewhere in their history that that has changed and it's probably less to do with them being a bad thing, but the rate of change for the fact that it's now currently provocative. So the move is provocative and we've got all those dilemmas. What do we then do? Just tell someone don't do, don't lift your head, over, don't lift your shoulder over 90 degrees for six to 12 weeks. Good luck telling me not to do that. That would be an absolute nightmare. Then I'm telling you I'm a painter. Then we had the shoulder symptom modification procedure to be able to have a systematic way of being able to change one thing of the movement, take a provocative movement overhead, tuck it in my shirt, throw in whatever it may be, and then changing one thing at a time to see if we can change the symptoms. Starting off with thoracic flexion extension, then scapula starting position retraction, protraction, depression, elevation, anterior tilt, upward rotation, and any or combination of all of those through to, this, to the humoral head starting point, which is going to often need some external input, whether a clinician's hand to be able to guide the start point of the humerus or a band, as is the case in some of the exercises I've taken directly from Jeremy Lewis's work and put onto your blackboard. Right the way down to the final one there, which is symptom neuromodulation, which is where we would try and do some sort of manual manual work at the same time as getting overhead and seeing if that if that changed somebody's symptoms. They don't do them all, we just find something that when they got to do that activity that we can try and make that not pr provocative by one of those movements that doesn't keep produce keep winding up their symptoms because that is what it's going to we keep doing the activity that's provocative it will keep the system sensitized and we will not give it a chance to settle down. And that's where, unfortunately, a lot of people 
end up going to have surgery to make them have that relative rest. Here's your test that you need to be familiar with. That is going to be your low tolerance test, empty can, full can, nears, Hawkins, Kennedy, and resisted external rotation. Okay, they're gonna be important not for the structure involved, which is often our, our automatic knee-jerk approach to what am I what is causing this pain here? Become familiar or comfortable with the fact that we probably can't say, but we can say 90 degrees of elevation or 90 degrees of scaption. That is where their symptoms are currently becoming unacceptable, above a five out of ten. <clears throat> and then we are going to be able to load manage that movement for a period of time and then build towards grading towards those movements that we're going to take out. So the movements we're going to take out, which would be elevation that is provocative in flexion or abduction and or resisted external rotation. Recall the fact that we don't have a blanket amount of strength that we can say we need to get this person to be able to achieve like we can in the lower limb. Personal communication there from Jeremy Lewis that that is being investigated. Um, I'm actually with Jeremy Lewis for two days in uh, March, so I will ask him again if that research has been published or how close it is to it. Um, but the caveat to that is that whilst we're saying there's not an amount of strength that seems to be universally important, what is universally important is that an exercise regime is progressive over time, and resistance training is one of the easiest or most uh, one of the most convenient ways to be able to prop. Uh, plot something that is progressive over time because you can easily see what someone is able to do in terms of their their function if we can see that their strength has got stronger so that's the shoulder symptom modification procedure that that we're working through that we covered last week and this was the final slide that I wanted us to have been able to get to, which is your really important slide. If you, this, is, if this is the only slide that you were to, to put a, a bookmark on to be able to come back to, because this is where we take what is the, the most powerful thing, it seems, from surgery, which is to load, manage, relative rest, taken serious for six to 12 weeks. And those are the movements. Elevation above 90, resisted external rotation, or if those aren't, then a specific provocative movement that you would have identified either through questioning or through uh, through other other orthopedic tests or strength tests okay i put this in here because this is from brett Contreras, who is a personal trainer that i really respect who is also a researcher he is one of the leading um, I, I would say no he's clearly the most the the most famous trainer for getting female figure athletes on stage for bikini competitions and getting into that very distinctive hourglass shape of big glutes and being lean and what he tries to get his females focused on is not just how they look which is something that is subjective to themselves and often a lot of these people have body dysmorphia problems that's the reason they've even ended up being in a, in a position where they feel like they need to be able to be judged, but saying, okay, so how you look is something that's subjective based on, you know, what you had for breakfast this morning, how you got on with your partner today, what your current, you know, are you depressed? All of these things are going to influence how you look in yourself. But if we can shift your focus towards strength, you know, on your hip thrust, on your deadlift, on your, on your, on your Bulgarian split squat, those things we can plot as progressive over time. And get that aesthetics as a nice as a nice secondary goal. And I think that there's a lot to be learned there for us in rehab to be trying to to be trying to shift our patients from being purely focused around the subjective things that are difficult to quantify, which pain definitely fits into that, towards function and things that we can plot as clearly progressive. And that's what this little graph here illustrates as dotted line of function which we can plot as going up over time we will have the Toblerone effect of pain that will be up and down up and down and that will be inconsistent but when we can look at function we can keep ourselves with motivation to persevere where we otherwise might say well I'm still in pain and I'm still I'm still fragile and I'm still I'm still injured and 
fall off the wagon from what is otherwise a really effective program. And I've worked with people who have, particularly with shoulder pain, that <laughs> their shoulder pain simply hasn't changed. And after red flag triage, we're confident that there's nothing sinister as a cause. We've got them focused on, went through all the pain, education, hurt doesn't equal harm, tissue damage, all the safe, all of these things, to work with people for three months, six months, 12 months, some of them even 18 months, function through the roof compared to what they were able to do previously, but still in pain. So unless, you know, unless we were able to show that function and progress, they might perceive that it was a failure, which would be a great shame. Because as Phil Glasgow says, um, you know, one of the most powerful things we're doing in rehabilitation is show someone what they can do and be able to continue training and exercise around pain or the injury. Anybody who trains regularly will always know that you always have an ache or a pain or a niggle that you're constantly training around and that will shift constantly. So helping our patients to be able to do that is something that is often very liberating. So at the end of your assessment for putting someone through those provocative tests, your three tests, your resistance isometric test, tests, you're going to have a diagnosis around whether this is an irritable or a mechanical non-irritable. And remember that's going to be acceptable pain is going to be up to maybe a four or a five out of ten, or you maybe use a different you use a different criteria where you say it's gonna be mild, moderate, or severe. There is whichever you're going to use, and a mechanical non-irritable pain prov provocation uh, on this pain testing would be that you go into a Hawkins tenedy or you go into an overhead position and you get unacceptable pain on a certain range of movement. You come out of it and the pain settles down. It is produced by the mechanical task or by the testing. An irritable shoulder will be that you do the test and it doesn't settle down then when you come out of the test. In fact, it lingers on beyond not just the actual testing session, but past 48 hours. For some people, it will be weeks and even months where their shoulder stays in pain, yet we can't identify a sinister cause. And that's going to be an irritable shoulder. That will be often what will be diagnosed as a shoulder impingement syndrome. It'll be uh, a mnemonic that ultimately, uh, I, I, Adam Meekins, I think I heard say this, uh, the shit, something hurts in the shoulder, shit. Yeah, that's right. Where we don't know what it is, but there is this pain diagnosis around the shoulder and you know we can have other presentations of that would be like a frozen shoulder where you seem to get this tightening of the capsule in a quite predictive way yet it's still very neurological in nature so it's an irritable shoulder and that's going to be managed in a different way to a mechanical non-irritable shoulder and these ones are generally a little bit more challenging because it involves a bit more of a pain-based approach but we still need to try and find an entry with isometric so here's the guidance from Jerry Lewis's paper there around how we would do that with isometric exercises um, based around a 50% maximal strength. Now, this, even that might be too much loading for these people and it flares them up. Look at the dosage here, three sets of 30 seconds up to five minutes rest in between sets. You know, this is, this is really, we're probably talking more about trying to get someone some analgesia or some pain relief here than, than any sort of progressive loading program. Uh, and you're probably going to be doing this with potentially some ice therapy or um, pain education and a full program to try and to try and establish either one of two things, pain relief or the lowest entry of loading, which is isometrics, to be able to have some footing to progress from. Because remember, with, with isometrics, as soon as we can get from, from doing isometrics to isotonics, that really has to be has to be our goals. But I'm going to play this as a video to show you how you might find that entry point for application of these isometrics. Isometrics for the rotator. When setting up with isometrics for the rotator cuff, we're going to want to do our resisted isometric muscle testing to so internal rotation, external rotation, and in varying positions because we want to be able to add static resistance in the direction of where this is. And then an irritable rotator cuff tendinopathy, isometrics might be our entry point for 
baseline loading to be able to get going, or it could be for analogies or payload. Okay, so we want to be able to set up a position, particularly with an irritable rotating cuff or irritable shoulder. Elevation is probably going to be an issue, so we're going to start off by trying to find an isometric setup with the elbow by the side. Some people will use a towel by the side here or something to be able to, to use as a pivot point. I'm going to show it without, and I've got a band here. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to try and find about 50% of resistance, and that's what the research shows as a, as a framework, but realistically, we want to be able to get enough that somebody, somebody can get a 30 second hold. Okay, so I'm going to get this position, get my elbow onto my side, and this is going to be into external rotation, where I can step in and I'm going to keep in a neutral position, keeping my shoulder and ear apart. I've got a nice strong setup from through the floor all the way through to my shoulder so that I can actually produce force and I want to be able to try and get a 30 second hold. Okay, my arms already started to shake there and I've suddenly pulled out of external rotation. I can change or we can change the angle of the setup of where someone's symptoms are because we want to be doing this probably just off where the symptoms seem to be provocative for our patient. So if I was to just turn my body slightly, if I could do this with a more closed angle in the more internally rotated position, or if I step in, we could even do it a little bit further out. We can play with where we would do our isometrics for 30-ish second holds. Now it may be in your testing that it's not it's not external rotation in this position that is where the symptoms are provoked. It may be up in an abducted position. So being able to apply the same concept with bands in that position might be where we want to start. So being able to get the elbow and the shoulder in line and then getting an appropriate band resistance that we can then stay in this position. Try not to let the arm come out with 90 degrees. And now this is an external rotation with my arm in abduction. Similarly, we could get this as a setup here and get this position here for an external rotation isometric. So this, I can step into the band to reduce it. I can step out if I come too far. I'm not going to be able to hold my hand in end range external rotation and that might be where I apply my isometrics. Turn my body 90 degrees and now I've got external rotation isometrics in flexion rather than abduction. Already really lighten up my shoulder. If someone was, if there's some, someone's symptoms were provoked during internal rotation, then I'm going to show up my left arm, where we just do the same thing where the resistance is going to be to internal rotation, and then we could find, again, the appropriate setup for tension to provoke that. There is another alternative that we could use for this, and that would include using weights, and we could do that sideline. So, if I just get a light weight here, this is a couple of kilograms, I can pop myself into this position, elbow by the side, again we can pop a towel there and get an isometric hold in this position for 30 seconds, establish somebody's load tolerance. And down. The idea with that over time would be in this position we can work up through heavier resistance. Isometrics for rotator cuff. Is there any questions around how you might now take this and be able to apply based on the video that I just shared there? It's a good chance to be able to, to, be able to ask that because one of the, I think one thing that, um, that a lot of people will get a little bit uh, confused around is so, some exercises, it's about progressive overload over time. Other exercises, it's, it's literally about finding an entry. And I think that's really where, where this stuff will Will, will sit is you know a lot, it's quite difficult to quantify progression on a band whether you're standing here or whether you're standing here you know, a little bit more band tension so I think that whilst if someone simply cannot tolerate 
isotonics then uh, and, and that can be the case by the way which is I had a, a tendinopathy in my medial both medial elbows from lots of um, lots of things last year including body weight calisthenics that I couldn't tolerate any isotonics in my in my elbow flexion so for a period of what of time for about a month I was just doing isometrics so I had a mechanical non I had a mechanical irritable tendinopathy that meant that when I when I wasn't doing anything on my on my elbow it was it was not painful but mechanically load it bring it on unacceptable amounts of pain definitely unacceptable so in that sense there over the course of a month the goal if you go back to dosage chart is to get as much resistance as I can for 30 second holds the maximum amount of strength maximum amount of resistance so the progress could be over uh, through resistance for that period of time but the goal really is to be able to load manage, stop doing the provocative thing, and for uh, for my symmetrics, it would be really to try and get an entry point to be able to get going. So I wouldn't be too hung up on progressive overload um, as the only as the only factor as the only factor with these because this, in these irritable shoulders, this is such low loading. You know, you're talking under fifty percent of someone's maximum contraction and three reps of 30 seconds with five minutes rest in between you know and even that could be too much they're simply not tolerant of load so that's when we're, we're probably gonna possibly gonna consider down co-management of pain management and if we can't get any control under on the symptoms then you might consider the the next lines of care for um for for pain relief um, but again, that has a caveat, doesn't it? Because we are told and we read, you know, that we don't want to be unnecessarily over medicalizing these issues. Challenge when it's you and you are in a lot of pain and you can't get it under control. So that is the that's the caveat to to that, and that's isometric. So hopefully you feel comfortable around the setups there that I've that I've shared in the video to be able to do some isometrics with your patients and feel comfortable around the prescription uh, just let that play in the background that's maybe some end range isometric supported at the elbow but they're not a panacea we want to be able to progress from um from isotonic uh, to isotonic as soon as we can so maybe we would do uh, a set this is what pete maliaris would say do a set with someone in person and then they do the rest away from you i would from my own experience i find that people getting people training that or rehab rehabbing accurately from the start saves on on, on go re going over stuff again in the future so i would do the uh, the full protocol with them of that i want them to do um at least for the first couple of sessions and try and give them some scope for being able to then you know be able to learn how to be able to write down your notes how that how that might look so 10 kilogram side lying for 30 seconds 10 kilogram for 30 seconds 10 kilograms for 20 seconds okay so we're failing there we can see that we can set a goal um then getting them to be able to then do that away from me um so that would be that would be touched on on isometrics so they're often are more challenging cases and then it leads us into mechanical non-irritable and i've only got about 25 to 30 minutes here to be able to touch on this so realistically um it's it's just it's just given a bird's eye view around structure that I brought here, which is something that you can hopefully take some inspiration from um, in your clinical year now and beyond when you graduate. Because this is the framework, which you could maybe just simply go to Gemini's paper. I fully recommend you, 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 you do that because I've put it on Blackboard um, and you, you can use his guidelines, which I've poured in here, which is to consider loading every three days to establish load tolerance and if you find that you irritate it you go back a level to isometrics which we just went through if we're load managing elevation and resistant external rotation for a period of time then our options for a graduated program will include shoulder flexion so returning to shoulder flexion and incremental from low range to high range and increasing from no resistance to resistance and from short lever to long lever and that's a couple of definitional terms that i brought in then from body weight training what the prescription around that 
might open up and might look like because that lends itself a short lever arm to be able to come overhead is something that we would call a bent arm or bent arm strength and then that has some exercise options that can can guide us and equally come in with a long lever is what we would call a straight arm or straight arm scapular strength which is something that again opens up lots of different ways to exercise and train and most people unless they have a background in calisthenics or, or body weight strength training will be very unfamiliar with straight arm strength and it'll be something that will be alien to two people so there'll be a learning component but a shoulder external rotation program graduated to build that up is also um, an option so we could do either or or we do both and of course that's going to be part of the art of working with a person they're going to be your classic exercises that i could have just put in from the start and said you know this is the you know this is your shoulder rehab exercises and most people are familiar they'll show you a therapy exercise that their physio has given them at some point um so that is in there as part of the bigger picture look at this here five out of ten pain is got to be seen as permissible so again we've got a job in getting framing that with our patients if they're going to actually engage with that so as i said i've brought in the because this is not something that i've that anybody has done that i've seen it is to make these phases from the lower limb and then apply them to the upper limb level one two three and four like uh, from the ego santo work and this is the graduated shoulder flexion program where Jeremy Lewis says the start point or the guidelines here is up to 60 degrees of elevation. So that's going to be somewhere between by your side and up here at 90 degrees. I would say go as far as where the symptoms are provocative and often that's going to be at about 90 degrees or even a little bit higher. And this is what I was talking about there, short lever to end range. So you would be coming up into a graduated elevation with a short lever or a bent arm or, and then progress to full range of movement with a long lever or elevation with a straight arm. So that enables us to create some levels based on that Sancho work where level one would be isometrics that we just went through or we'll see for the irritable tendinopathy for prescription around that. And then level two, the constraints I've put on the top of the title here would be that flexion below 90 degrees. Okay, so we're going to be doing elevation exercises where your humerus comes to 90 degrees or lower. And the programming suggestion is going to be, you know, I'm certainly no expert, as I've said, with each group around strength and conditioning programming. I have trained under a lot of great coaches and I've and I've read and exposed myself to lots of different programming methods. And you know, if we're taking that we're going to be load managing for six to 12 weeks as this is what is uh, suggested here then it falls quite nicely to have as a framework four week blocks can you make four week blocks where you set somebody exercises that they can work on and progress within that time and then you reassess maybe at four weeks but of course you could be reassessing as frequent, frequently as you want but i think changing exercise selection and frequent um, exercise selection too frequently prevents us from being able to actually drive drive adaptation of course if your if your clinical reason is that you're simply looking to achieve novel movement then you can change exercise selection all the time from a conditioning perspective we need to have some repeatability and within there the variables that we can control are speed tempo range of movement rest period and the level of difficulty look at the programming that I put on the bottom there if you go back to your dosage chart right at the start that should make sense for maybe the foot on the left there are three sets of 10 to 15 with a 3030 tempo of course we're not talking about what the specific exercise is yet um, we could progress over the course of several blocks maybe each one would be a four week block through strength and then through power to four sets of six to eight reps with a three zero as fast as you can up zero tempo so again the structure that we've been working through up to this point hopefully starts to give you an idea of how you can piece things together so here's some categories if we can look at things through the lens of a bent arm strength and straight arm strength which is something that we do in bodyweight strength training it opens up for us to be able to make some categories i'm not going to be able to spend too long on these so i'm just going to really touch on some of the areas so that the the programming suggestions that i've put in here 
could at least be explored by you. So if we were to take a bent arm strength, and we again look at we're working with under 90 degrees of elevation, we could come up with some horizontal push exercises. And that would look a lot like if you're talking about body weight as an option, it would be a push-up. Okay, so I'm just going to let that play there in the background um, as one example. But you need to be able to have a track to be able to tailor that to the level that a person is able to do. So if someone can't do a full push-up on the floor, then being able to make it as an incline, so that, you know, look at the rep ranges on the last page that we just talked about, 10 to 15 reps, and then being able to have a track of progression. So being able to, the video that's playing there now, is a full press up negative, knees down on the floor, and then a long kneeling press up positive, as I would call it. And notice that the elbows are staying, you can't see it too clearly, but the elbows are staying tight. I'm not going into a flared position, which is not a bad position, but again, bring it to what we're load managing. We're looking to load manage elevation, inflection, and abduction. So it, this is this is where I think some uh, traditionally people like Kelly Starrett, etc., would have said, you know, you're not in a you're in a dangerous position to be pressing in this elbow flared position that a lot of people will do. It's not a good or a bad position because that would be where most people will be strongest on a bench press. It's a position of abduction that is potentially provocative. So being able to find an entry level where someone can, you know, I haven't got time through here to be able to go through coaching, uh, pedagogy, I've got a lecture for the end of the year that we're going to be. Uh, going to spend a bit more time on that, but a tight gymnastic push-up is a good option for being able to work within this constraint of 90 degrees and abduction. So, if someone doesn't like bent, uh, doesn't or doesn't engage with body weight options, can we create a similar version with resistance? What have you got in the gym as a bench press, a decline option? There's different ways use a bump, a barbell, kettlebell. Or, or other options for being able to load that up. But again, what I would be encouraging here would be a tight elbow position so that we are load managing that flare position. Potentially do that for a block or two or for the duration of load management before we might go to a flared position to see if they're able to tolerate that again then. And much like we talked about with hanging or, or from the evolution of our shoulders compared to monkeys, we can tolerate these things over time. And if you're actually following in my training at the moment on on social media, you'll see that I'm doing a lot of flare position, which we call Bulgarian. Anything with a Bulgarian next to it means basically a flare position. I've also put in here um, that if someone was wanted to do a much low, lower load than any of those, then you could do an equivalent standing with a band where you press it um, in a horizontal press with a similar mechanics that we've just described there. And dips are also a good option because they're, they take your humerus from full uh, extension and with a bent arm you press till your arms are by your side so again we can train generally people will be able to train dips so can you go from a, a track of progressions that is maybe your old school p bench dip right the way up to maybe a ring dip so you're doing it on a, a wobbly surface so We've got a flex, uh, got a category here. I put in pull to be able to look at a bent arm pull option because generally it's good to balance pushing and pulling uh, or front of the body and back of the body. So could we do the same thing, avoiding that flare for a period of a rack row or being able to do some rows on rings um, or equally doing it on a machine or, or leaning over a dumbbell row or a barbell row to be able to balance to be able to balance those pushing and pulling out. Maybe we identified in our shoulder symptom modification procedure that the scapula start point was a really helpful thing in terms of their symptoms. Maybe we found that scapula retraction and then elevation gave them a big relief on their shoulders. So maybe it gives us some suggestion that some retraction based exercises could be beneficial. So this is the section of straight arm scapular strength. So this is what that SASS means if you're looking at body weight literature, will be the elbows stay locked and then the strength, apart from being able to maintain that straight arm, will come from your shoulder blade. Again, we've got this working under 90 degrees and having a track of exercises that would be in protraction. So a shrug in a plank position, retraction. So imagine you're in a rack row, 
and you're going to squeeze your shoulder blades together so that the resistance is into retraction. Um, elevation, which could be standing and doing your classic holding a barbell as if you're in a deadlift position and doing shrugs. Um, that would be a way of doing elevation with arms by your side, because of course, if you had arms overhead and did elevation, that would look more maybe like a handstand type thing. Um, and depression with arms by your side, which would be something like an L-sit. Um, I'll just let that play in the background there if it comes on, because if you've ever had a go at doing an L-sit on a, on a set of bars, you'll have noticed very quickly that your shoulders want to scrunch up to your ears, so you have to press hard with your shoulder blades down to keep that scapular depression, and then otherwise it might look like a core exercise, but being able to have a series of progressions there could be could be really, really helpful because that could be something that someone is really safely able to train and exercise whilst we're load managing overhead. And I've put it in, um, I've put in some straight arm elevation drills here, which is not playing. How long did that, how long ago did that cut off? Two minutes, okay. Um, I will get that back on. Hopefully this will play. Uh, I'm gonna show you a straight arm elevation. It was, I was just basically, if you could hear me, then that's gonna be the most important, uh, the most important thing with what I was just going through, but I will draw your attention to it now in a second. Uh, but it's back on now, hopefully. And this is an example of a straight arm elevation drill that someone might be able to do. This is a Zanetti press where, again, we're load managing from going above 90 degrees. But this hollow body position, you know, the legs out straight here is the hardest one. You could go into a straddle or in a tuck if you can't hold this position. But that would be an example of a straight arm Straight arm, share application screen. Why is that not sharing there? Loading programs there. There, that should be showing fine. So basically what I was just describing there, my camera went off was being able to have tracks of exercises for protraction, retraction, elevation and depression of the shoulder blades. Okay, and that was really what I was talking through whilst showing just basically an L sit there. Um, where your shoulders will will want to collapse away from your ears and having the ability to depress your shoulders through your scapula is uh, is a nice exercise drill. And this flexion and extension with a long lever was that example of what I just showed you. It was a Zanetti press, which you could do a similar thing with cables. And it's a nice exercise for tying in core strength work because, again, we're showing people what they can do whilst also saying maybe don't do that for a period of time. If you have a go at that Zanetti press drill, you'll realize that your elbows want to bend, that your core wants to lift up, and it's um, yeah, maybe a, a, perhaps a, a, nice, a nice straight arm elevation drill for you to be able to have a go at with, with your patients. Um, but a lot of us will be maybe a little bit unfamiliar with creating the structure to a four-week training block and that's what I've created here is a couple of examples of how you might program so the warm-up is then going to be your external rotation level which we may not have time to cover but it will be at the end of this session for you to to be able to look at but then a1 would be a horizontal bent arm push of course your programming is in your dosages chart b1 would be horizontal bent arm pull C1 would be a horizontal straight arm push, D1 horizontal straight arm pull. And then we could have a flexion and extension so, so, um, drill as well. Equally, if someone is familiar with the drills, we could do a more advanced training method, which would be supersets. I would not use supersets for two different exercises or two new exercises where someone's not got a grasp of both exercises because it just becomes a cocktail of confusion and not doing anything well. 
But if someone is familiar with what their horizontal bent arm push exercise is and what their horizontal bent arm pull is, then we can superset those without them to uh, negatively affecting each other, being more efficient with time. Equally, horizontal straight arm push, so like a scapula, scapula shrugs, and horizontal straight arm pull, so a retraction row, <coughs> could be a nice superset. Another version that I've put here would be to do a horizontal bent arm push, so a tension-based exercise, a strength-based exercise, and then that being superset with a softness or a movement superset. So if maybe from the shoulder symptom modification procedure, you found that thoracic flexion and extension was a movement that was helpful. So being able to program that for a period of time, maybe two minutes, between, between the strength exercise gives this nice tension dissociation component to a session so we have tension on tension off simultaneously getting somebody to be able to develop the skill to be able to to do both how many times are we going to train or rehab per week you know we're always going to be working with the person in front of us so you know it may be that we can only get somebody to do a1 their horizontal bent arm push that's all that we can get them to be able to to do and a couple of times a week but so other, for other people, they might be athletes or they might be saying, no, I want to be able to train and, and this is really annoying me because I can't do my normal training. So they want to be able to have a full training program. So then we could look at the Ego Santo framework as an example or the Jeremy Lewis, which talks about loading for three, you know, every three days. So some sessions, some weeks, that might be three sessions a week, other sessions, it might be two. And being able to, being able to, work with the patient's preferences what do they have available to them that might influence whether we want to provide a body weight body weight exercise selection or a gym based one or some hybrid altogether and i'm not talking really about uh, creative movement prescription here we've got a whole whole lecture and presentation on that this is for progressive loading loading path pathways so this is what uh, an example for us to plug in some exercises into those from what we've just covered would be, for example, this bottom one that you can see here is a straight arm push, scapular protractions in plank, maximum range between the shoulder blades with no bend in the elbows, maintaining an entirely straight body line, which we'll see from the side in a second. And that could be perhaps superset with this thoracic play improvisation where this drill here is simply about trying to explore any and all of the ranges that the shoulder blade offer us scapular dyskinesis in full swing to be able to explore all of the ranges different speeds bring the torso in bring the arms in and it's often helpful to be able to have a little bit of music with that sort of task to try and cultivate a bit of a sense of, of flow and ease of movement but that's an example for being able to piece together a level two programming. And my, my ta task to, on the bottom there is for you to treat it as a, as a hypothetical task. You know, how many versions of a level two program based on the categories that I just offered there and the constraints around saying we're not going above 90 degrees or we're not going into an abduction. You know, how many versions of a level, level two program could we create? And it really, hopefully you'll, hopefully you'll come to see that it could be infinite. There's so many ways that that could be brought to life, both by yourself and, uh, and, and different things that I haven't included in here and for the, the person that you're with and the constraints around where you're operating from, whether you're working in, uh, in WIOC, in, in the rehabilitation section there, or whether you go into practice and you only have a small treatment room. Versus, where, versus being in a gym where maybe some of the other options come to life. But that's really, um, hopefully, the thinking process that I'm offering you to be able to, to work with here. As I said, the mechanical non irritable if we can take relative rest seriously, it does become really liberating how many ways we could create a logical progressive program. And that is important, that it is logical and that it is progressive. So say we've done now a, a training block or rehab block for four weeks and their pain is no is still unacceptable on tolerance testing. We might repeat that training block and change the variables, which means that we might, might 
move those exercises um, might move those exercises so just the push-up might be moving to keep the same movement so we still use a push-up but it might move from a heavy slow resistance tempo through to a velocity tempo so the movement would stay the same but we'd move it on a block in terms of progression maybe well, what i'm offering here is that the testing has now become acceptable so now we are opening up to say that we can go above 90 degrees we can start creeping back into abduction without taking pain unacceptable so we can now manipulate other variables including range of movement okay and that is what level three then is to flexion to end range overhead okay and that would be uh, that would be based on maybe their anatomy but also based on where their current limitation is with their pain okay and being able to use this concept of touch it nudge it tease it means that we can achieve changes in someone's end range or changes in someone's mobility not through stretching even though you may have seen me using that a lot i'm very aware that we can also achieve the same thing through resistance training so biggest bang for buck is training through full range of movement and touching nudging tees in the end range so apply the same categories that we just made there in terms of bent arm push and pull in horizontal now we're saying we're releasing the constraint of going above overhead so we're going to have a series of exercises for vertical bent arm push potentially still not using a flare or we could use a flare position if someone is not provoked by abduction so from a body weight perspective that's going to be an inverted press so like a pike push up on the floor that could progress all the way up to a handstand push up and if you were maybe in a gym with more conventional resistance you would use a shoulder press or a military press to be able to use barbells dumbbells for getting overhead now i like the landmine as an option in shoulder rehabilitation because it's sort of a hybrid in terms of pressing it's not horizontal it's not right overhead vertical it's into that in between range and you can change the the angle based on where you stand and something that it also ticks on uh, ticks in terms of box of shoulder rehabilitation is what Jeremy Lewis says in the assessment is important to assess the kinetic chain that is also contributed to the shoulder a lot of people will develop shoulder problems from throwing for example because they don't have efficient force transfer through the floor to be able to get rotation through the glutes and the real powerhouses that their shoulders are then picking up the slack and doing more than they perhaps might be with someone who's able to produce rotational strength through from the floor so while Jeremy Lewis suggests that he doesn't know a movement screen to be able to test if the legs are going to be a potential problem or contribute to someone's shoulder and he suggests just doing strength tests on the quads just doing strength tests on someone's calves to see if that elicits any obvious obvious weakness i don't really bother i don't find it tells me anything what i will do though is in a program is likely put some sort of landmine in because it trains fast or it trains shoulder force production from the floor this drill here is actually a lunge version from my patella program that we're going to get to but the the options for creating and using landmine for the kinetic chain idea is something i think is is not worth not worth dismissing um, you also saw there some some powerful presses against the wall which would be level four which is to apply yeah push presses yeah good example paul uh, but push uh, pushing fast against the wall with much lower load is an example of a um, a level four exercise that we're going to get to in a second i'm just going to touch on this because this would be the long lever version of the vertical work so vertical long lever with the arm overhead elevation is going to look much like your handstand type stuff so it's been a fascinating journey for me and in, in learning these things from when exposed to this sort of stuff sort of four or five years ago with paul um overhead end range overhead depression is going to be hang based work and that's where um i've actually did about 20 hanging programs in the shoulder stability project this is just one you can see playing in the background there around 
the constraint being that the elbow stays straight. You can play with the grip to be able to, again, explore scapular play in that position there. Um, but again, I've got too long to go into that, but the straight arm strength overhead and um, pushing and pulling would be hanging and handstand, or you could come up with a resistance alternative with dumbbells um, or a lap pull down machine. Now, in terms of a structuring of a program, again, what we would do based on the Sancho work is because we've progressed from horizontal push and pull, it means we don't, we don't just stop doing those we add so we have a horizontal we have a level two programming and then we also now can create a level three programming which is where the emphasis is on a vertical bent arm push vertical bent arm pull vertical straight arm push vertical straight arm pull and so then we have like a session a and session b which we can alternate if i can if i just chuck in again a lot of random selection exercises from those categories that i made you know the horizontal level two one might look like a dip variation with a rack row variation a plank scapular shrug with a scap retraction then the level three one might be inverted press with pull up with a handstand variation for for a vertical straight arm push with a hand variation for a vertical straight arm pull and if we alternated those sessions, session A, session B, maybe on week one, it looks like Monday session A, Wednesday session B, Friday session A, then the following week they do session B, then session A, then session B, and it's gonna fall probably on different days for different people, but the general trend and the theme over the course of the month would be that they're working on those two sessions to be able to progress within the rep ranges and the schemes that we provided them. This would be your level four, which is where the main variation now, the main progression is the speed, where we're moving to a less than one zero, less than one zero type velocity, 20 to 30% of a six rep max, and maybe one or two times per week. And that is going to be um, also great, used to be able to grade someone back to their overhead work or throwing, if that is in their sport, for example. And how might you program that? Well, you can either do entirely speed specific sessions in the cells, or you could simply add a horizontal press with high velocity, like a, a medicine ball press against the wall, or lying on your back and press a medicine ball, or using a band for a push up, and you could do that for, for four to six reps immediately after the horizontal push of a level three exercise. Equally, if we were doing a kinetic chain, uh, like a landmine option, then we can turn that into a punch where we're, we're having the landmine in one arm and we're punching it as hard and fast as we can. Um, and maybe for a vertical high velocity option, we've got the, the you know, your old, fat, your, your very typical wall ball that you might see in a CrossFit gym. So to chuck that into programming, which I've highlighted in blue here, might be from a um, from a session A, which is a level two, push up for four to six, four sets of six to eight with a three zero x zero tempo, straight into lying on your back, pressing a medicine ball as high as you can for four to six, um, for four sets of six immediately after the after the heavy set, or in a vertical session B level three session, you do in a single arm landmine lunge press. So that's the video I showed there before. And then you move over to another barbell that you've got set up, which is lighter and you're doing landmine punches, four sets of six each side. I've got videos of all that on my YouTube channel and they are linked into this. But again, we've already run over for time and I haven't even got on to the graduated external rotation program. So just to orient you for some of you that might be interested, there's progressions from lying on your side with your elbows supported through to external rotation where you are then supported upright with support under your elbow. External rotation with you being upright with no support under your elbow to full range of movement external rotation. So those are the guidelines from Jeremy Lewis that I've again converted into levels one to four with variations around doing it supine, prone, all the way through to something called a Cuban press, which, um, or I'll play this one here 
for give you to give you an example of how we might turn this into realistic conditioning that might that would challenge anyone that you would work with. Graduated external rotation conditioning rehabilitation program, or equally beyond that, it could be what we would call prehabilitation, where we have an ongoing conditioning of external rotators to balance out to balance out an pressing or strength condition that we otherwise might be doing. Okay, and this is a drill that I was first exposed to with movement culture, with movement culture at the Eden Portal way back when I was going through rebuilding my shoulders, and it's utilizing a uh, it's utilizing a principle of escalating mechanical advantage. So we're going to take an external rotation drill in a mechanically difficult position until we can't do any more reps. Then we're going to go to a position that's slightly easier to try and get a little bit more reps and then out one more. So we're going to do a drop set of three positions. So we're going to take a, uh, a dumbbell and I'm going to do this and then demonstrate this on a bench, but we can, you can equally do this on the floor. I'm just more comfortable doing this on a bench. I'm actually going to elevate my thumb up a little bit more because it helps me get into a position where I can get my elbow onto my onto my knee and that then is just below my shoulder that's just where I'm going to offer this drill to be performed we could do this in multiple ranges without this back here my bum's a bit lower and I'm up and I'm leaning backwards you may be fine without this back okay and the first position we're going to do we're going to be supported through all of these drills and I'm going to be square on to the direction that I am uh, that, my, that my arm is out in flexion and then we're going to perform controlled external rotation reps in this position. Okay, so this is a diff mechanically a difficult position. We're going to do a controlled negative and a strong positive up for full range until we can't do any more reps or close to one or two close reps away from where we wouldn't be able to complete the repetition. Then I'm going to just subtly shift my body angle, not that now, so I'm not square, but I'm on sort of a 45 degree angle to the direction of my support, where I will then continue with the external rotation rep, full range, control back up. Until I can't do it in that position, and then I'm going to open myself out again until I'm now as close to square or in line with my body for the final position to complete external rotation reps. Okay, I've got eight kilos here, which is quite tough for me. I'm going to go until we get to that point where we can't complete any more reps, and then that would be a set. So we have a mechanical drop down from this position to this position to this position, then we would have a rest, and then we would do multiple sets, maybe four, five, six sets, and see how strong we could get over the course of the training block, which might be four weeks, six weeks, and then we might rotate and change the exercise to a different one. Okay, so I'm going to just perform a set now with this on my, on my other arm. So if you have a go at doing these, play around with the setup. These are intense and you want to go to the point where you will do, so if you notice here, you want to set up so that you get sort of five to eight reps on that first set before you probably can't complete another rep. Then you're going to open out into this 45 degree angle so that then you try and get one or two more reps. How many do I get here? just another two and then open out into this last one as Paul just said there oh, my hips are very limited so you know you might have to shuffle your feet around to be able to to get yourself into a position or maybe being higher up that's again one reason why the bag helps me there so that you're not in 
as deep a hip flexion as I've as I've got there to then get as, as many reps as you can through that final mechanical drop down and I've got another four there. So by all means um, we've run over by we've run over by 10 minutes there um, but by all means explore through the different levels of external rotation and make sense of that to program married up with Jeremy Lewis's work and um, you know I like to be able to a little bit like uh, Louis Gifford when he writes his is his, his books is to say you know if, you, if you're interested in where I've taken a lot of this from you know do what I did all of those programs there are what I've um, immersed in over the last five five to six years um, to become familiar with the programming that I've suggested there and the different ways to be able to move and train they're all online programs that you can access and what I've done is bring all that and marry that up with Jeremy Lewis's work to make it clinical in a pain-based progressive program. And I think it hope, from my experience, and I know that Paul will say the same when we do this with people, it opens up maybe more interesting ways for people to be able to exercise and move. That then gets people focused on being able to achieve a new level, being able to do something that they currently can't do, or something that is maybe more motivating than just doing an exercise because you're being told that it's good for your shoulder which is where maybe some of the old-fashioned just do these external rotations three sets of ten five times a week uh, probably don't get done so i uh, appreciate that you stayed with me for 10 minutes over so suggest that there is some interest in in this area uh, we're not gonna have any more time to go through the shoulder so contact me um, if you have any individual questions we will be moving on to the ankle, knee and hamstring over the next couple of weeks and then depending on my lecture allocation whether we will do my contemporary exercise prescription which will be all around task-based training, cueing, dynamic systems theory and there is your cocktail for really bringing all of this to life for making rehabilitation programs with somebody. But hopefully a really useful resource here for you to be able to pull exercise dosages, some structure, some frameworks and some ideas. Okay, thank you very much guys and I'll see you um, I'll see you in a couple of weeks.